I'm doing it from the house. So hopefully this will go well and everybody, everybody can hear me. If you can, just shoot me a chat or something and I'm sure I'll see it. Um, but anyhow, I think we'll get started here. Um, now bear with me one second. Okay, somebody said you hear me, so great, thanks. Appreciate that. Thank you for uh, sending me that. All right, so I think we're going to start today. This is kind of round two of um, just what we were doing with Medicare, just successful Medicare sales. And again, I took a lot of this from my own experience building my own book and also, but probably more of it from other producers um, who have experience building books of business as well. So kind of took the best practices from a bunch of places when when talking about this. A uh, couple things, we record all our webinars, <clears throat> so we will record this one as well. Uh, you will get a copy of the recording from us when the webinar is completed. Uh, we do these every Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, next week, we're going to kind of focus on growing an agency for those who are interested in that. And um, if you have any questions uh, for the webinar, uh, just send them to the question box on the webinar, and I'll answer them at the end for you. Um, and then the last thing I think I forgot to say is if you want to attend a future webinar, but you can't make the time, uh, just register for it and you'll get the recording. So you don't have to attend to get the recording. If you register, you'll get it. Today's webinar should run about 25 minutes, I would guess. Um, so that's that's what I'm guessing for the uh, running time. So today we're going to talk about, talk about prospecting and selling, growing and maintaining a book, and commissions. On the growing and maintaining a book, uh, a lot of that is taken from things when I was building my book up over the years that I wished I had done that I didn't do until the end. And then it dawned on me, had I been doing it, uh, my book would have grown a lot bigger, a lot faster. So, um, and then just some feedback from other agents as well. All right, so prospecting and selling. Of course, prospecting is the biggest challenge when it comes to success with Medicare sales. I mean, if you think about Medicare, you're not really selling. It's not like long-term care or life insurance or investments where the person can either decide to do it or not, where you have to make an emotional sale sometimes to get them to commit. Medicare is like auto and home. They're going to do something. It's just a matter of are they going to do it with you or not, to be quite frank. Um, do they feel comfortable with you, that you know what you're talking about, um, you know, comfortable working with you? And if they do, then you'll you'll get the sale. I mean, if there's a sale to be made. So really, it's not the selling aspect as much. Certainly, knowledge is important. You know, you need to know what you're talking about. But true sales skills aren't that important. But when it comes to Medicare marketing skills and um, marketing diligence and kind of being creative with your marketing efforts are the most important thing because you need to get in front of the most people as possible. That's what it really comes down to. I talk to a ton of people who say, well, you know, Ed, when I get in front of people, I close them. And I always say to them, well, most people do. Uh, the real skill with Medicare sales is getting in front of enough of them. So it's really, it's, it comes down to prospecting and marketing. I should have put marketing on there well as well, because kind of one and the same, but <clears throat> Medicare is a marketing business, uh, referral business, but we'll get into that. So as I mentioned, with Medicare, it's simply a matter of understanding Medicare, the products, and the election periods. I, I can't tell you how many people, um, is at one point myself as well, to 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 be honest with the thing, um, they'll be selling Medicare, but they don't really understand Medicare A&B benefits that well. And if you don't, I just recommend you brush up on them because I mean that's that's important when we're talking about giving people Medicare plans, we're talking about covering the things A and B don't cover and, and giving them drug coverage. So it's important to understand those things that aren't covered and how Medicare A and B works. Um, so again, the sale with Medicare is simply getting the opportunity. Um, so we'll talk about ways to prospect. Um, there are, this certainly isn't a, a, an inclusive list. Um, there are a million ways to prospect for Medicare. I talk, I'm gonna talk about some of the more popular ones um, today so but definitely don't you know don't limit to what I say today um, today I'm just talking about some of the more popular ideas we see and also it helps if you can work the presentation that 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 comes in handy sometimes there we go
All right, apologize for that. Um, all right, usually I would say the best way to market is in more than one way. Certainly we have a lot of people that they just choose one strategy to market and prospect. Um, that is, you know, you can do that. Um, but usually the most successful people have one main prospecting method, but then they have multiple other methods that they incorporate at the same time to a lesser degree. Usually people will buy leads. Um, if you're buying leads, um, you know, sometimes you don't have a choice other than that. If you don't have a natural book of business to work, uh, if you don't have connections with other people with books or access to doctors' offices or things such as that, you got to get in front of people and buying leads is usually one of the options to do it. Um, and what I will tell you is all, all leads have challenges. Um, there is no such thing that I've found, and I've been doing this a long time, I've never found a great lead that you buy. Great leads are referrals. Great leads are um, word of mouth when people refer to you. Um, business relationships you have with various places which we'll talk about but when you're buying leads they're always difficult there's challenges to all of them and what i always used to say is all leads suck because they do they're hard to work they you know sometimes that's what you got to do um but they all come with their pro own problems so one of the types of leads that we have agents use the most um are our phone leads and again these are no exception phone leads have major challenges i'll talk about um, but a lot of agents do use them. I'd say phone leads are probably the leads that we see used now maybe the most, and also they're the ones that are complained about the most. So anyway, phone leads are when you purchase telemarketed leads from a vendor. So some people will have their own telemarketer in-house or they'll use um, onlinejobs.ph uh, to get a telemarketer that they hire, but often they'll buy them from a vendor. Um, I said usually around $10. Actually, we have a vendor we work with right now that's $10 per lead. Um, and any lead vendor you work with that is doing telesales leads for you, if they don't record the lead, then find somebody else. Um, you really need the lead to be recorded because you got to listen to it and hear what they're saying. We'll get into that a little, a little more, but um, that, that's, that's certainly, um, certainly important. Okay, when you're using phone leads, you can only legally call for Medicare supplements. Uh, so your telesales leads are going to be med sup leads. But here's the thing. Um, you're getting med sup leads, but hardly any of them will be med sup candidates or most of them won't even be people that want a med sup or even know what it is. Keep in mind, most consumers don't know the difference between Medicare supplement and Medicare Advantage. So they'll be calling for sup leads, but most of the people you talk to, they're interested in a zero premium plan or dental or vision or maybe they're a dual eligible, um, they really won't want a supplement in most cases. Once in a while, you'll get a sub sale, but not that often. And when you're using phone leads, you gotta be really careful of bait and switch. So what I mean by that is, since you can only legally call, cold call for med subs, uh, that call goes in, it's recorded, it's sent to you. And if you call that person up on a callback lead and say to them, Hey, let's talk about zero premium plans or, you know, you want dental and vision with a Medicare Advantage plan. You're definitely not being compliant. The compliant way to do a phone lead is to talk to them, ask them some questions. And then when they bring up, oh, I was more interested in a zero premium plan or a plan that gives me dental or vision. You would then say to them, OK, that's that's a Medicare Advantage or Part D. We can talk about that. But let me just text or email you a form to sign. And that's the scope you're sending them. A, no, a number of phone leads will also be dual eligible leads. Um, if you're running into a lot of duals, um, as you know, we offer both Connecture and Sunfire. So we have Connect for Medicare and Sunfire, with our, which are both online enrollment platforms. You have free access to them free of cost with us to both of them. Uh, for duals, I'd suggest Sunfire. Sunfire does a much better job. It's a much easier process for enrollment of duals versus Connecture. And I would argue that Sunfire's scope is a little simpler as well. So if you're receiving phone leads, you need to track all of them. And here's why I say that. Um, you got to track every, every lead that comes in. When you get the recording, you should listen to the recording. Keep in mind, these companies, a lot of times their reps will say the wrong thing. Uh, they might not ask the questions they're supposed to ask. They might get the wrong answers and still give you that lead. And what you need to do is listen to that recording. And if it isn't what it's supposed to be, then you ask for a credit or a new lead. So it's really important to track these and it's important to call, call them over time. 
Um, I know most successful agents will call people, attempt to call them eight times, um, up to eight, because usually that's about what it takes to get uh, in contact with some people. So the other thing to know is when you're talking to people on the phone, you don't have time to have doubts or not know what product is the best in their area, you need to know the products. So if you don't know what's competitive in a given state, don't get leads there until you do. I think that's, um, I think that's really important. So that's phone leads. And like I said, one of the, I'll go back to those for a minute. One of the reasons people use phone leads is um, they're, they're quick and easy. You can order phone leads and get them within a couple days or the next week. They're cheap at 10 bucks a piece um, and you can get selling quick with them. But again, like I said, they definitely have their challenges as well. Talk about mailers. Uh, there's still a ton of agents out there using mailers. Uh, a lot of them use uh, vendors. I'd recommend a vendor if you're gonna do mailers and you can use a vendor to do a thousand piece mail drop. Sometimes you'll do multiple thousand piece mail drops. Um, but the idea is they'll show you the types of mailers. Maybe it's a dual mailer or a T65 mailer. Um, they drop it, you hope you get a good response rate. You should be looking for a price point with a mail company of about 500 bucks and they should include everything the mailer, the postage, them sending the mailer back to you, everything. When you order from a mail vendor, be careful. A lot of them will say, well, let's drop a T65 order for you for people turning 65 in the next three months, stay away from that. Uh, they might wanna drop mailers to people turning 65 in the next three months, but I can promise you if they do that, uh, you're gonna get a terrible response rate. Stay away from anything in the next six months. Um, usually, if you're doing T65 mail, you want to go out 8 to 12 months to get the optimal response rate, which would be 3 to 4%. If you go people turning 65 in the next three months, you're going to get like one, one and a half. Also, mailers have a terrible response rate during AEP. Makes sense. Everybody's mailing them at that point. So if you're thinking about doing mail drops in September or October, I'd suggest against it because you're going to get a, a really low response rate. When you do get these mailers back, they're not layups. Um, half the time, the people will say they don't remember filling it out. I never asked that question anyway, by the way. Um, but you need a simple pitch for mailers that's to the point. And the other thing I notice with people that do well with mail is they keep the conversation very casual. It's not super business or formal. It's a casual conversation. Um, keep track of all your prospects and continue with follow-up. Um, the biggest thing I notice is some people will get mailers and call through them once or twice. You're not going to do really well that way. You got to follow up on all of them, track them, and keep calling them over and over until you get a hold of the people. And again, you know, sometimes you're going to look at six to eight attempts to contact them before you actually get them. But most of them you will get sooner or later, so keep trying. So the biggest challenges with a mailer are contacting the people in the first place and overcoming objections. By objections, I mean, you know, people might say to you, oh, I'm all set, thanks. And you're like, okay, great. You got to have a good response to, you know, a good a good rebuttal for that, that objection that they're giving you. Just briefly want to talk about branded versus generic. Most of these companies, when you try to get a mailer, they'll be generic pieces. They're not tailored to you. They don't say your name. They're just generic mail response pieces trying to get a good reply. Uh, generic pieces, believe it or not, will usually get the highest response rate. Branded mailers, meaning if you call one of these vendors like Target Leads, Lead Concepts, Arm, if you call one of them, um, they'll give you a generic mailer. But if you want a branded mailer, they'll make you one for a one-time fee usually, where you can put your logo, your number, all those kind of things on it. Branded mail might not get as good of a response rate, but you can definitely uh, do a much better job of it building a local presence. Um, and if you're gonna do branded mailers, just realize they're gonna take time to kick in and you want to focus them on your town and surrounding towns. It's once you want it to be a very local thing. If you have questions about mailers or phone leads, you can certainly call our office and be happy to talk to you about it. Um, you know, in in with it in detail if you'd like. Next thing we see a lot of seminars. Obviously, last year people didn't do many um, because of COVID. They are coming back in a big way this year. Um, they're a great way to prospect, but the key is you got to get people in the seats. Um, you can have the best seminar ever, uh, but if you don't have people attending, it's not going to help you much. So that's the biggest challenge with the seminar. 
uh, a well a well done um, if you put on a good seminar people will you will get sales out of it it's just you got to get people there a lot of the seminars we see are carrier assisted meaning the agent has done a good job of working with their agent manager so each company has a ma agent manager and the agent does a good job having a relationship with them and helping and getting them to help them with their seminars so they might go to the united rep and say hey i want to do seminars i was thinking of this location and if they trust you if they think you'll do a good job uh, and if they aren't haven't already filled up all their budget for seminars for the year um, they can help you in there are some carriers out there that will pay for all your mailings and do all your advertising for seminars. Those are carrier assisted, meaning the carrier is helping with the cost. Then you have sales versus educational. So in the past, educational seminars weren't all that helpful because even though a lot of people still did them, educational seminars were very restrictive in the past. They're not anymore. So if you haven't looked at the updated guidelines since 2020, at an educational sem seminar, you can basically do everything now that you can at a sales seminar. You just can't show product specific information and you can't take an app. Um, but you can, an educational seminar, you can hand out your business card, you can get a consent to contact form, you can do scopes, you can have a meeting with somebody, a sales meeting right after the seminar. Um, educational seminars now are a good seminar to use. Um, like I said, you're just not going to write an app right there. You can't bring an app with you and you can't get product specific, but you know, you can you can mention company names, you can talk about advantage versus supplement, you can do whatever you want. You just can't specifically show plan designs and write apps. The other nice thing about educational seminars is you can offer meals at them. That's why you see so many of them now done down south at like Golden Corral, because the meal has to be under 15 bucks, but you can offer a meal and you can't do that at a sales seminar another way to get people in the seats that i see i never did this myself i kind of wish i would have is a gift to attend you can do that it's got to be under 15 bucks but you can offer a gift for people to attend the seminar it can't be contingent on them enrolling in a plan but if they attend they get a gift uh, meals as i mentioned you can't do meals at sales seminars you can do snacks but at educational you certainly can and another way to fill the seats with seminars is to do a seminar associated with a group. Those help a lot, maybe associated with a senior center where they can help bring people in or a housing development or um, a medical group. Uh, there's definitely opportunity there for seminars with medical groups. I think if you're gonna do seminars, the lowest cost way, if, if you don't have some kind of um, a group or organization that's going to help you, the next lowest cost way is to do the carrier assisted because they'll pay for the cost of the advertising. Otherwise, I do, you know, gifts. You can do an educational event with meals or, like I said, get help from an organization or group that will help put people in the seats. Retail, if we talk about that, that's become more and more popular. Um, retail works very well, but it takes time and patience. Uh, reason being, if you're going to sit at a store, uh, for example, a Walmart, a CVS, a Walgreens, that's great, but you're going to have to put in a lot of time and set hours at the store. You're going to have to be there uh, in order to be successful at retail. Usually we have retail, um, people do retail if they don't have a big book of business. If you have a, currently have a big book, it's hard to put in 30 or 40 hours at a store when you should be renewing your book during AEP. Um, but if you're in a good retail lo location with foot traffic, um, they certainly will work if they're done right. So some tips to make retail work is foot traffic. Like I said, you need a store with people coming through it. Uh, that's why, for example, Walmart super centers are so popular. Uh, you need an appealing table. Um, you see a lot of uh, people that have retail tables and they have nothing on it. My suggestion would be have really good giveaways. You can give them from the carriers. If you talk to your agent managers for each carrier, they'll give you giveaways. Buy giveaways at the location you're at. So if you're at Walmart, buy cool giveaways to put on your table. Um, maybe get order uh, a bunch of discount cards from GoodRx to put on the table. Some people get way out there, do things like popcorn machines, stuff like that. But really, it's as simple as the more appealing your table looks, the more people are going to come over, the better you're going to do. Make sure you have consistent hours at the store. So usually the best way I thought to do it was to go to the store for the first week, see when there's the most traffic for your audience, 65 plus people. 
and then adjust your hours um, to when it's busiest and then keep those hours consistent so that everybody knows that's when you're going to be there. And then a lot of agents that are really good at working retail will have a good relationship with the pharmacy and they'll also have a good relationship with the store employees and they'll wind up writing store employees when they turn 65. So that, that makes a big difference. Things like doctor's offices, housing complexes, and agencies with other lines of business can all be great. Um, presentations at those kind of places can be super productive. Um, I, a really good example is if you can find another agency that writes other lines of business but not Medicare, that can be a home run, it really can. Uh, PNC agencies are the best example. I have a lot of agents I know. They have built a relationship with a PNC agency, sometimes big ones with a lot of 65, turning 65 and 65 plus clientele. Uh, and that agent will pay a $100 referral fee. That's the most you can pay. They'll pay a $100 referral fee for every advantage and supplement they sell. If you're gonna do that, which it will work, there certainly would be some health broker agencies some PNC agencies that would be interested in that. If you can find them, you just gotta find them. Um, but if you're gonna pay them $100, make sure you pay it to them and don't make them chase after it. Most people are probably rolling, rolling their eyes saying, well, who would do that? But just about everybody. Um, the ones that do well are the ones that just pay them religiously, their $100 referral fee for every piece of business they write. I think the biggest challenge with some of these things, the doctor's offices, housing complexes, is to create the relationship. I mean, you gotta have a relationship to get in there in the first place. Example I usually give is, you know, there's a lot of people now that are doing presentations and or not presentations, but have tables. They're doing retail at laundromats. It's very popular now. Um, well, you need to get a, go in there, talk to the person running the laundromat or the owner, uh, and convince them why you should be in there. You, know, you got to have that relationship. The other one I mention a lot is uh, a couple women that were doing. Um, they volunteered at a number of food pantries, five of them in fact. Um, they got into Medicare, they set up tables at all five food pantries, they had really good giveaways. They talked to the people running the food pantries and came up with giveaways that would be helpful for the people. Uh, and the two of them rank hundreds of dual plans every year. Uh, actually, you know, four or 500 a year, in fact. Um, so be creative uh, and you know, when you get creative, you got it. You're gonna have to take that leap and go create a relationship with some of these places. Something like Walmart, CVS, or Aetna, that's more of a buttoned up program. Although with CVS and, and uh, Walgreens, um, that's all controlled by the agent managers. So a relationship with them is important. A couple other ways I wanted to mention, Access Health is a big one. I, I couldn't stand working with Access Health or the exchange, Ex Access Health in Connecticut, but the health exchange, um, while it drove me nuts, uh, we have a lot of agents that write exchange business because it's a great lead system. A lot of those people are turning 65 soon. So that, that's, uh, that's a good one. I get a lot of questions about online search. Hey Ed, can I get set up so when people Google search, I come up? It's, it's doable, but it's nearly impossible. It is a very difficult space. The SEO um, competition for online search is really tough. So my point is just building a website is not gonna get searched to your site. A site can certainly help you close a sale. if Somebody looks you up online, but it's not gonna draw in prospects. So. When you get pitched by a company about, oh, we'll get you set up for SEO to search really well, probably not is the answer, unless you want to spend a, a lot of money every month. People, people ask too about advertising. Advertising consistently will help, but it's slow and it's a long-term thing. So if you're going to try to run a couple ads for a couple months, that's not going to do much. You really need to run them every single month or every two weeks consistently and over time it will help but it's not instant, instant gratification with advertising. Okay, so as I mentioned on the selling part, Medicare is an education more than a sale, it really is. Um, you know, the things you need to know is how original Medicare works. You need to know original Medicare enrollment rules, so I'm not talking about Advantage Part D or Supplement. You need to know how somebody enrolls in Medicare A and B, like when they're auto enrolled, because they're already drawing social security versus delayed part B enrollment, you need to know those rules. Um, gotta know advantage versus supplement, and it's gotta be concise. Like what are the, can you con succinctly and concisely 
give somebody a summary of what are the pros and cons of Advantage plans and how do they work versus the positives and negatives of the supplement and how they work. You need to know the enrollment rules for both your special elections. You want to have, if you, you know, if there's any opportunity to enroll somebody with a, a very kind of vague special election that people don't know about that often, if you know it, it certainly helps. Um, certainly know your drug help programs in your state. I'm not talking about just Medicaid, but I'm talking about Medicare savings program. You really need to know your Medicare savings program well. Uh, states like New York with Epic, um, Connecticut has a super expanded Medicare savings program, but knowing the drug help programs can go a long way for you. Today's day and age, everybody's very concerned about ancillary benefits. So that's the big thing now because of Joe Namath and Joe Namath type commercials, you know, dental, vision, hearing, over the counter. Need to know which plans have the best ancillary benefits. A quick way to do that is either on Connector or Sunfire. You can just do plan comparisons on there or on our quote engine that we provide through Pinnacle. Um, if you're not access, accessing either system or if you don't know what I'm talking about, please call us because um, it's something you should be using. Asking questions is really important. Um, I think a lot of times we'll meet with somebody and just try to tell them everything we know and what they should do. Um, it's important to take time to figure out their situation. Ask them questions. Sounds basic, but it, a lot of us don't do it. Ask them questions and just figure out where the need is. You know, what, what aren't they happy with? What are they looking to do? Ask questions um, and they'll kind of sell it for you. Enrollment's important, obviously. Um, when you're enrolling, you know, knowing Sunfire or Connector are very important. Uh, knowing that you can use those systems, they're CRMs, they'll save and run drug lists. So you can run the drugs and save the lists. Uh, it'll keep your client's data. It'll keep the application, the scope. Uh, you can save doctor's lists on there. So if you're using one of those systems or both, um, that's very helpful uh, in my opinion. And obviously through both, you can enroll through text or email with, with all of the main carriers. Companies certainly have mobile apps. Their mobile apps are great, but a lot of times they require face-to-face -face versus a Sunfire connection that does not require face-to-face. -face. Um, and then company voice authorizations. So just about all the carriers out there have a voice authorization system where you can do enrollment purely by recorded voice enrollment. Um, we all have access to it. It's just a matter of learning each company's. So if you don't want to enroll somebody through Sunfire Connector because maybe they can't get a text or an email to enroll them, learning the company or at least a couple of the company's voice authorization can come in really handy. And of course, then there's still paper applications. Um, at Pinnacle, they still have a department with five people in it that process paper apps. Um, you know, Remember to order kits, uh, paper apps, sometimes they come in handy. I'm old school, if I'm having trouble with technology or anything like that, I'd just grab a paper app, I'd have it with me and get the application taken care of and then send it in. I always forget to tell people how I do business and then I'll do the whole presentation, I'll enroll them in a plan and then they would come back and say, well, okay, what do we owe you? So don't forget that piece, it's important. You explain to them you're just like an auto and home broker. The insurance companies pay you, they don't have to pay you anything. So I think that's important to, to mention at the beginning of the meeting as opposed to at the end. Um, that way people aren't wondering the whole time. And I find out they, they don't really don't understand that quite often. I, I'm surprised how many people have said to me, well, well, you know, how much do you charge or do we owe you money now? Meanwhile, I should have addressed it right at the beginning of the meeting to get it out of the way. All right, growing and maintaining a book. This is where I probably did the worst job. Uh, luckily, I had other agents help me out with uh, this along the way and just kind of talking to other agents. Um, referrals are huge in our business. The rules changed in 2020 uh, for Medicare. When you meet with somebody, you can tell them you like referrals, that you want referrals. You can tell them you offer a referral gift. Uh, the Medicare rules used to say that you couldn't talk about referrals at the meeting, you can now. And I would definitely say to promote it. The last stat I looked at said only like 25% of agents actually ask for referrals or mention them. Um, but that's the easiest way you're gonna write business. As I talked about before, buying leads is hard. Referrals are a great way to get business. They really are. And if you think about it, people refer Medicare better than anything. Um, 
they don't talk a lot to other people about their life insurance or maybe even their investments or their long-term care, but they certainly talk about Medicare. And if you've done a good job for them, they will refer you if they know um, that you want referrals. You you assume that they would know that, but they don't. So as I mentioned in there, just have a good pitch as to when you're meeting with them, you know, why you like referrals and why you would like them to refer people to you, you'll do a good job for them as well. You know, straighten everything out for them, help them understand. Offer a referral gift. I didn't do that for years, I should have. Um, a referral gift over time will make a huge difference. It's up to you how you do it, but what I'd recommend is if you're gonna do a referral gift, if it's a good referral, whether you close it or not, as long as it's legit, give them the gift. I used to do a $15 gift. You really don't need to. Um, you can do 10. I know I, I figured out over the years that there's really people don't appreciate 15 more than 10. So save yourself some money and do something that's worth 10 bucks. Calling spouses four to five months before is big. So when you write somebody, if they've got a spouse who's say 63 years old, 62, put that spouse in your calendar to call them four or five months before they turn 65. I used to assume they would call, and I think other agents do too. They only call about 20% of the time. So better for you just to call them four or five months before they turn 65 and get 100% of them, because those will be automatic enrollments for you. But make the call and reach out to them. Don't rely on them calling you. A couple other obvious things, but things you know you just might not think about. Somebody you meet during the year, you can't do anything for them. Reschedule them for AEP. Let them know their plan's going to change or their rates might increase and just schedule them right then. So if you can't close them in May, try to get them again when you talk to them at, during AEP because their plan's probably going to change. When it comes to putting people in your calendar, no matter what line of business or who you're talking to, even if they're 60 years old, talk to them, find out what their date of birth is, put them in your calendar to call them. And you'll be surprised how quick two or three or four years will go by and suddenly, boom, they're in your calendar for you to call them because they're gonna be 65 in five months. Build a pipeline for yourself that way. I used to ignore all that stuff and it wound up costing me a lot of enrollments over the years. So email lists, um, something really that's important to do is every client you write, get their email. Uh, and then start a, a monthly newsletter. It can just be a monthly email, a newsletter, something, just to stay in touch with them, but get their email now. Everybody 65 and older checks email now, um, way more than they used to. If you send them a monthly newsletter or email, it's helpful. Also, when there's big changes, if maybe you've got 300 people rolled in, enrolled in a certain plan and that plan's having big changes for open enrollment, you can send out an email to the whole list of people with that plan to notify them. Birthday cards, I know a lot of people that do them, I think they're good and bad. They're good because they work, birthday cards. They're bad because once you start sending them, as your book gets bigger and bigger, you got to keep sending them. So I know some agencies and agents now, they'll have thousands of clients. They've been sending birthday cards. It's not like they can stop now. So they're sending out thousands of birthday cards. I'm not saying they're a bad idea. I'm just saying something to think about. As far as retaining your book, you should call out to your existing clients. I mean, ideally it's four times a year. I never did that myself. That would be the ideal. Uh, but at the least, you gotta be giving them a call before AEP. If you're just hoping they renew, uh, you're, you're gonna have a higher turnover than you would expect. Um, either you or somebody else should be giving them a call prior to AEP to see if they wanna discuss options, letting them know a little bit about their current plan, and if there's something better out there, seeing if they want to talk about it. The earlier you call them for AP, the better. I would not wait to make those calls until October 15th. Uh, you want to start hitting those calls in September, I would say. Existing client seminars, um, this is usually for agents with they have very large books. What they will do is they'll have a huge book of business. They'll have uh, multiple seminars for their existing clients. They'll invite them, and at those seminars, they'll talk about what the plan changes are for the coming year for multiple plans. And they'll usually, um, well, almost always, they'll encourage them when they come to the seminar to bring a family member or bring a friend, you know, just to try to get more people so they can get new sales out of it. And it works well for them. All right, when to hit commissions, this is important. I know a lot of people have questions about this, about how they get paid and when. 
Um, we have a webinar specific to this. I don't want to take too long on this today because I want to finish up here. Um, but commissions, basically, when it comes to advantage in Part D, um, that is very public information when you're doing commissions for advantage in Part D. So the thing to know is CMS sets the max advantage in Part D commissions that you can make by a given state. And um, you can just Google that. So just Google Medicare Advantage Commissions 2022. Uh, they'll come up. You can see what they are. And pretty much every carrier is at the max commission now. It's broken up by state. Um, the max commission for Advantage is highest in New Jersey and California at 672. Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and DC, 607, and then all other states, 539. Just easy, I didn't put the renewals in here because it's half of the initial. So whatever state you're selling in, that's the max commission, it's half of that for the renewal. And that's the same with every company. Um, if you're getting less than that with somebody you're with, then you're below street is what they call that. Um, but that's the amount you should be getting uh, for commissions for, that's the 2022 amount, Actually, I made a mistake there. That's 2022. That's what it's going to be this coming year. But anyway, just Google search it if you want to see the amounts or just email or call our office. Keep in mind that Medicare Advantage and Part D commissions are prorated. Uh, what that means is if somebody's not new to Medicare, let's say you're just advantage, it's an advantage to an advantage change and you write it in September, you're only going to get three twelfths of that commission. Now, when it's brand new to Medicare, it's not prorated. But if it's coming from an uh, advantage to another advantage, or maybe it's somebody that's been on a supplement or been on a Part D plan, it's going to be prorated. So just keep that in mind um, that it's going to be prorated when you're um, when you're when you get the commission. Most of the companies at this point pay within a few weeks of the application being submitted. There are a few that still pay. Sorry about that. There are a few that still pay um, after the effective date. So we're gonna uh, talk about Part D commissions. It's the same rules as Advantage plans, um, just a lower amount. It's $81 in, in new state, uh, or I'm sorry, it's $81 for a new sale. It's half that for a renewal, and Part D is prorated as well. Medicare supplements are completely different. Um, a, Medi a Medicare supplement doesn't follow CMS rules. Um, some carriers pay flat dollar amounts. Um, some pay by a percentage. It depends on the state and the company. Um, they usually pay levels, so it's the same amount new as the renewal. They're never prorated. Um, and usually they pay on a nine month advance. So as I mentioned here, a lot of carriers go by percentage of premium. Um, the percentage is 15 to 25%, depending on the carrier. Uh, the ones that go by percentage, some just go for, like I said, a flat dollar amount. Usually they're level for six to nine years. Uh, most of them are lifetime, but after nine years, they'll go down in how much you get. And again, there's a nine month advance on these. Um, some of them will pay as soon as the premium's received. There are a few carriers out there that will make you wait until the effective date before they pay you. Again, if you have questions on that, you could certainly call us. That's all we had for today. Uh, this seminar ran on for a webinar ran on for a while. I uh, appreciate you joining us. We'll send a recording out to everybody that attended. Uh, at this point, let's see if we have any questions. Well, I have the initial person who said they hear me when I was asking in the beginning. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and are there any questions at this point? Let's wait a few minutes here to see if there are any. Um, well, if there aren't any questions, I appreciate you joining me today. Remember, we do these every Wednesday and Thursday. You'll get a record a copy of the recording. Other than that, since there's no questions, I appreciate you joining me today. And oh, here's a quick question. What are good referral gifts? Um, that's a great question. I mean, it, it could be anything. I've seen all kinds of things. Um, you can do gift cards, by the way, but they can't be a Visa gift card. And they can't be a card that's readily convertible to cash. But you could do like a Starbucks gift card, Dunkin' Donuts card. Those are good gifts. People like stuff like that. You know, you set it at like 10 bucks. You Like a Dunkin' Donuts card, for example, you can get your logo and phone number on it. Um, some people I've seen do pies. Uh, they'll do uh, various things. I mean, there's all kinds of ideas out there. Are there agents who write 200 plus policies during, open during the open enrollment period is the question. There are, certainly. 
Um, however, once agents get really big books, a lot of times open enrollment uh, slows them down because they've got a big book. But those agents will certainly write 200 plus policies outside of open enrollment. But yes, I definitely have agents who during AAP write 200 plus and there's a lot of them out there. Um, but there's even more of them, they have big books. So they're a little tied up with that big book during AEP, renewing people. And then outside of AEP is when they really write a lot. Um, and obviously outside of AEP, they're concentrating on things like duels, turning 65, people coming off work coverage, those types of things. Uh, somebody asked me if I can focus on a new agent, um, a new agent writing 200 plus policies during AEP. Um, I would just say to call me about that. Call me or email me. We can something we could talk about offline. I can give you specific details. All right. Well, it looks like that's all we have for questions. Um, appreciate you joining me today. Hope to see you on uh, future uh, webinars. And um, I hope you have a great day. Thank you.